But we do see hereditary changes, otherwise obviously I wouldn't be giving this talk or it would be quite short. <laughs> um, and they're uh, actually fascinating, and one of the reasons that they're fascinating is that they're things we're all really familiar with. So again, this, what we're seeing here is you have these changes across successive generations because certain genotypes and phenotypes are, are doing well in anthropogenic environments and others aren't doing well. And so we see them then um, being perpetuated into the future in a hereditary way. So this has actually been really well documented. And this is one of the things that perplexes me as to why, how anyone could possibly fight with you about evolution when we have seen it in at least these four things. These are nice, very clear-cut cases, but there are many others. So, Harvesting, domestic, domestication, supplemental feeding, and chemical treatment. So the four kind of broad categories that I'm going to address today, these are not the only things. So harvesting is kind of a, a big group, and this is probably one of the oldest ways in which we've acted with the selection pressure. Because from the very first moment that we appeared, we had to eat. And in order to eat, we had to go out and fish and hunt and collect things. And not too long after, we started doing agriculture. And all of these things you know, are taking things from the environment. This is kind of an interesting example in more modern times when we collect things uh, to study scientifically or to look pretty on the wall. And what's really cool about these things is that the exploitation that we've been doing has always been non-random. What do I mean by that? Well, there are certain things that we're really interested in. The, these traits are kind of a nice summary of those things. So the age and size at which things sexually mature. If you think about uh, farmers, they want cows, for instance, that are going to be able to, they can breed quite quickly and they are going to produce calves for them quite quickly. So you want things that, where they can do this early on. Um, big things, whether you're hunting or whether you're farming, you want big things because you want the most for your money. Sexually selected weapons, so things like horns and tusks and antlers, um, you know, trophies, the things you want to decorate your wall or lodge. Timing of reproduction, so if there's a time of year when maybe resources are short, then you want to find the thing that's going to be present, or you want to grow the thing that will kind of fill that gap so you've always got food. Certain behaviors are more interesting than others, and this is actually something that we kind of study in our lab a bit, where if you have certain animals that are very bold and aggressive, that can be advantageous to them in the wild, but when they uh, come across people, that's not great, because that means that these are guys that are going to be present and obvious to humans, and they're going to be picked off and eaten, because they're going to be accessible. And also, dispersal and migration is another interesting one. Um, if you think about the crocodiles in Africa lying in wait in the streams as the wildebeest come across during migration, that's the same sort of thing that we can do. I mean, if you know where your prey is going to be, you can just sit there and let it come to you. So all of these are things that over time we've been interested in. And that means that we are then going to have a particular selective action as we focus on those traits. And that's going to then have a particular, a particular evolutionary response in these organisms. One of the cool things is actually the difference between the effect we've had on wild populations and the effect we've had on domestic populations. So hunting and fishing versus, well, and gathering as well, versus agriculture uh, and, and husbandry. <coughs> so basically, with wild populations, the traits that we're interested in, the really big size, the giant antlers, whatever it is, those are the things we look at and take away. Those are the animals that we kill before they can pass on their genes or pass them on very often. So examples of this are the bighorn sheep here in the western U.S. They've documented a steady decline in the average and maximum size of their horns. And that's because hunters have gone in and killed off all the big individuals, which means that there are no longer genes for really big horns. Um, Elephants and in Africa, you find now that elephants are more often tuskless than in the past. So in one place in Zambia, for instance, uh, they found like a 20% drop, 20% uh, increase, sorry, in the number of tuskless individuals just over a couple of decades. So there's this remarkable change that we've placed, uh, we've pushed in these, in these habitats and in these populations because of the things that we're interested in. On the other hand, 
in agriculture and in husbandry, we're interested in maximizing certain things. And so we're increasing the number of times we see certain traits, and we're increasing the expression of those traits. So corn, for instance, you see wild corn. It's not very tender. It's not very sweet. It's often kind of small and measly. And we've selected for things that have huge kernels. They're nice and sweet. Uh, they, they grow at a, a certain time of year that's quite handy. The cobs themselves are enormous. They're easy to break off. All sorts of nice things. And you know, chickens that have lots of chicks and that have them quite often. Cows that produce tons of milk or lots of calves. Whatever the case may be, we're positively having an impact on these populations because we want them to have lots of the traits that we want. <coughs> Now, I'm going to go through a couple of the examples of, of harvesting that I mentioned in a bit more um, detail, just because it's interesting to think about some of the things that we're actually familiar with, um, that we interact with in our own lives. So if any of you are anglers, then you might recognize this fellow up here. This is a brown trout. And brown trout in Europe, um, and in the UK in particular, have been fished for a really long time, for centuries. And as a result, they are quite difficult to catch because these guys are smart. They have learned the techniques for evading humans, and so they are much more difficult to catch than other trout. And they have been introduced into the U.S., and U.S. fishermen quickly found that these guys are ridiculous in comparison with American trout. And one of the things that was suggested was that American trout have been fished for much less time, so they haven't quite learned all the techniques that these guys know. And that's why there is this difference in how well you can catch them. And that might sound like a bit of a reach, except that here we have a large amount of bass. And these guys were grown in a laboratory. And researchers found that there were individual susceptibilities to being caught on a line. And that these things were hereditary. So if you are an adult and you're quite susceptible to grabbing onto a hook and being um, pulled out of the water, you will then go on to produce children that will also be just as stupid as you. And they actually have found that this will go for many different generations, one after the other. This is a very heritable trait. And so, if you think the opposite is true as well. If you're quite good at evading, you have young that can evade. So if you put these two things together, it is actually fairly obvious that in some populations we are pushing the evolution of being able to stay away from humans or um, being particularly susceptible to being caught by them. Another thing that's happened that's been incredibly well documented is something that's happened on large scale fisheries. So, I'm not just talking about things that people do for fun on the weekend, but trawlers that go out and collect masses and masses of fish at a time. This right here is an Atlantic cod, um, kind of relative to these guys, it looks enormous, but actually, these days it's not that enormous. On average, a young adult is going to be five or twelve, five to twelve pounds if you go to the grocery store. In the past, you could quite frequently catch things that were above sixty pounds. And in fact, in, 19, in 1895, there was an example of one that was well over two hundred pounds. And this was not unheard of. This happened, you know, every now and then. And what happened is, the nets that the people would deploy for these, they would let slip the little ones, the big ones were caught, and also they would just go out and toss away the little ones and keep the big ones. And if you do this over time, in really huge quantities, then eventually what happens is you take all the big ones out, you've taken all of the big genes out, and that leaves you with a bunch of little fish that aren't going to be nearly as tasty on your dinner table. And this is just one of the reasons why some of the fisheries are starting to collapse, because now we have all of a sudden quite small individuals. And in the water, if you think about other predators and other prey and who you're trying to compete with your resources for, um, all of a sudden now you have this fish that used to be huge and now it's tiny. And that's going to change the dynamics of all these interactions in the water. And that's going to have big ecosystem level uh, impacts. 